Hello, and welcome to PubK's 2022 Government Contracts Annual Review. We're thrilled to have more than 3,000 session registrants for the annual review. Over the last two days, we've already had five different presentation segments. This is our sixth, with six more to come over the next two afternoons. We hope you'll be able to join us for most, if not all, of the remaining sessions. But a separate registration is required for each session that you want to attend. If you have not already done so, registration is still open on the PubK website under the Annual Review tab. My name is Alan Schwatkin. I'm the president of the PubK Group and a partner in the law firm Nichols Lou. I'll be your host, facilitator, and moderator for this year's Annual Review. And I hope that we can convene in person next year. The PubK Group consists of three newsletters, PubK Law, PubK Compliance, and PubK Cyber. Many of you are already subscribers to one or more of these publications. And we very much appreciate your support. Some of you joining this annual review are not yet subscribers, but I hope you'll consider becoming one. Information is at the website shown on the slide or is available for many of the contacts you have at the PubK Group. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on these next two slides. I encourage you, to, encourage you to look at the skills and capabilities that these firms have. In lieu of speaker gifts and in honor of our sponsors, PubK is making a contribution to the Capital Area Food Bank. With the food crisis facing our communities, I hope you'll consider making an individual or an organizational contribution. Since this entire program is being held virtually, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled throughout the session. But we welcome your questions. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. However, with so many attendees, it will not be possible to answer all of the questions in real time. We're capturing your questions and will endeavor to answer as many as possible at the conclusion of the annual review. All presentation slides along with the audio will be available for download from the PubK Group website probably within a week or so of the conclusion of the full annual review. And we'll send an email when this information is available for download, how to access it, for how long the material will be available. We're also applying for CLA in a number of jurisdictions. And while we cannot guarantee approval, we expect that acceptance within the next few weeks. Again, we'll notify all attendees when those approvals have been received. If you're interested in obtaining CLE, please look for our poll question during the presentation. State boards require us to verify your participation during the event. The poll is a simple yes, no question, and we'll keep track of responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you do not wish to obtain CLE credit, you can disregard the poll or just answer for fun. Now I'm thrilled to continue the seventh PubK annual review with our section six panel on cybersecurity and information technology. Our distinguished panel members are Townsend Bourne from Shepard Mullen, Kate Groley from Crowell and Mooring, Bob Metzger from Rogers Joseph O'Donnell, and last but certainly not least, Kristen Grimes, who's the Associate General Counsel at the US government's Federal Bureau of Investigation. Bob, over to you. Thank you, Alan. I, I know I speak for all of the uh, panelists in expressing uh, our thanks uh, to PubK for uh, hosting the program and our appreciation that this year we have gone to two hours versus <laughs> one hour. And you know, the reason is frankly that um, it's been kind of a tough year in the world of cyber and supply chain. Let's go to the next slide. So my, my immediate task is to try to tell you, oh, one more. My immediate task is to kind of tell you what went wrong and set the stage. Well, you know, we could go in reverse order. The picture that you see on the right of your screen is a, a satellite photograph of Russian troops and vehicles who are poised near the Ukraine. And that unfortunately is a, an indication that cyber attacks, certainly upon uh, the Ukraine and possibly some directed against the US and, and its allies could be moments, hours, or days away. Um, we live in a world where the threat actors have, have expanded. 
uh, to include many forms of criminal enterprise who are principally pursuing ransomware. And of course, we deal with four primary actors among nation states, Russia, China, uh, North Korea, and Iran. Well, you know, one of the things that's fascinating is if you look at the kind of major events is that each of these were different and each of them I think had a different sponsor. SolarWinds was um, a startling surprise to the security com community. Uh, it was orchestrated by Russia after a great deal of uh, planning. It showed uh, sophistication, expertise, and patience that really was unexpected. SolarWinds uh, was uh, essentially a compromise of the software development cycle for the Orion software that SolarWinds uh, provides as a network management tool. And during the build cycle for a software update was corrupted, and that allowed the adversary essentially to plant uh, malware in a very large number of targets across both government and industry. The malware then conducted um, a form of reconnaissance. It decided uh, which of the targets mer merited more a hostile action. And then a command and control method was established using uh, US sources that enabled um, the instigators to, to target individual companies and to conduct at the very least, you know, surveillance, if not extraction. Many of the federal actions taken by the executive branch, as we'll discuss later, I think are in reaction to the, to the breadth and the danger of solar winds, and frankly, the possibility that we may not yet have eliminated all of its vestiges. Well, you know, that was Russia, a software attack. Then not very much later, uh, a Chinese group called Half, Hafnium found a vulnerability in Microsoft Exchange Server and were able to exploit that vulnerability to take control of thousands of servers across the world for essentially any purpose they might choose uh, until the patch uh, was installed. Colonial Pipeline, we all know about, that was a cyber attack with a consequence on operational technology since the pipeline wasn't able to work. Jans JBS ransomware was a rather vivid reminder along with Colonial Pipeline that you know, our, our quality of life, or in this case, the availability of meat products could be affected. Then we had a different kind of attack with Kaseya. Kaseya has a program which is a, a virtual uh, solution assistant. It essentially helps manage service providers deal with their own individual clients who they help with security matters. There, uh, the adversary was able to penetrate uh, the software of Kaseya and then Kaseya itself distributed that software to the managed service provider clients and they in turn to the many companies that were affected. Uh, more recently, we've had to deal with uh, the Apache Log 4 problem. This is uh, traceable to open source software. Uh, it's called CISA to issue an emergency directive and it demonstrates to us yet again that we have real problems in the delivery of uh, cyber attacks through software. And it certainly focuses on a subject that's also addressed in the executive order, namely what can we do to have better understanding of provenance or risk in the open source components that contribute to much of our software. And then coming to this week, Microsoft has seen evidence that there is malware disguised as ransomware that is targeting Ukrainian operations where its actual purpose is neither to demand ransom nor to expect to get it, but to literally destroy the systems on which it is planted. And I, earlier this week, CISA put out uh, a notice to critical infrastructure operators that they should expect and anticipate that Russia may attempt to use cyber attacks uh, to uh, affect, deny, uh, obstruct our critical infrastructure. Next slide. So I was a co-author of the MITRE uh, deliver Uncompromised report came out in 2018. It's proven to have some durability and, and influence. And unfortunately, many of the things that we predicted have in fact happened. In some respects, they've even been worse. There are four threat factors that we discussed. Cyber IT, which is an attack on your network or network system. There's cyber OT, operational technology or factories. There's supply chain. We've seen tons of that software. Kaseya as cloud delivered software, and even some now some examples of, of firmware. And then the fourth attack vector is the human factor. And of course, that one is all too easy to exploit as it remains true that the most likely portal 
for malware will be a mistake on the part of an individual in clicking an attachment or, or, or uh, you know, clicking a link that is insecure. So one of the things I want to focus on for just a second is cyber IT. And you'll see that I've put in five categories of, of consequence. Well, exfiltration is the theft of information of value. Most of the government regulations, including CMMC, focus on exfiltration. In other words, we're worried about, you know, gov about an, an adversary, China, taking information of value, controlled unclassified information. But in the last year, we've seen literally an explosion of ransomware, the purpose of which is extortion. And ransomware has evolved, unfortunately, to, uh, to, to situations where the attacker will try to deny system access or where it may insinuate malware that will corrupt files potentially or retrievably. And in some situations, the purpose isn't to get money or if it is to get money, it is to leave the system destroyed behind it. This is a tough world. And so far, government regulation deals with relatively speaking, a small part of it. Next slide, please. So I was asked to very briefly talk about the journey from CMMC 1.0 to 2.0. And I'm a little over my time, so I'll take just a second. You know, 1.0 was the idea that, uh, that the government would, would require any contractor to DOD in many, uh, in, sorry, any of 300,000 contractors to DOD to have an assessment as a qualification to get new uh, defense business. Now it's been rolled back as will be discussed further, but it, we have to acknowledge that it's been a very frustrating experience. You know, here we are, uh, what, a year and a half after the interim rule came out, and we have two rules that are in the maybe stage to replace the interim rule, or we could be waiting another nine to 12 months. I mean, one of the lessons that can be drawn from CMMC is that attempting to establish, uh, attempting to improve cyber on the part of the industrial base is pretty difficult to do through regulations or contract terms or even mandatory third party assessments. But I hope you appreciate the message from my earlier slides that the environment that every one of your law firms or your clients lives in is very hostile, very dangerous, and it is never going to go away, that is at least foreseeable to me. And so we've got to think of ways in which we can actually get our industry and our clients to improve their cybersecurity without necessarily being ordered to do so or assessed by the federal government. That's my intro. Well, given that landscape that Bob has just set, you can probably tell that the FBI has been pretty busy over the last year. So as mentioned earlier, I'm an assistant general counsel in the cyber law unit, which is in the office of the general counsel at the FBI. And although structurally I report up to OGC, my client is the cyber division. So I'm here to talk to you today about all the amazing work that the FBI cyber division has done to counter these threats that Bob has already discussed and that we'll talk about as we go through. And on the screen, you'll see the FBI cyber mission statement. So I won't read the statement to you, but I do want to highlight the bolded parts, which is the first is to the purpose of the FBI cyber direct purpose of FBI cyber is to impose risk and consequence on cyber adversaries. And we do this through a variety of ways that I'll talk about as I go through my slides. But one of those ways is through our unique authorities, world-class capabilities, and enduring partnerships. Our capabilities are situated around a decentralized model that we have where we have 56 field offices, 350 resident agencies, 63 legal attache offices, and coverage from more than 180 countries around the world. This decentralized model, it's not just for the FBI benefit, but it really helps the whole of government and the community at large. It involves a multidisciplinary threat team that has squads of cyber trained agents, intelligence analysts, computer scientists, and lawyers that are dedicated to supporting the cyber mission. Like I mentioned, we have an international reach and we have very specific teams that are, have technical capabilities such as a cyber action team, which is a rapid response technical team that is deployed nationwide to respond to the most complex of cyber incidents. Next slide, please. So I mentioned risk and consequences. I mean, that's what we're constantly trying to achieve. And while I've distilled that down to five words on this slide, it encompasses so much more. So. The, the fact that there's only five words here and I have about 10 minutes to talk about it should not <laughs> undermine or, or understate the, the work of the cyber division and the amazing efforts that, that they've done to combat these adversaries. So I'll start with saying 
you know, we renounced a new cyber strategy in September 2020. And since then, we've done so much to counter these malicious cyber actors. And part of that I'll go through as I, as I touch on these high level points. First is to unveil. So we've pulled back the cloak of anonymity that these cyber actors hide behind. And we've done this in conjunction with our global partners to publicly remove deniability from countries that are acting behind these cyber actors like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Seize, that's seizing money, domains, and servers. In the last quarter of FY20, the FBI seized roughly $10 million in cryptocurrency from cyber criminals, and that's just a tip, the tip of the iceberg. In January 2020, we disrupted the NetWalker ransomware actors, infrastructure, and money by arresting and charging one subject in Canada, seizing cryptocurrency, and disabling a dark website that was used to communicate with ransomware victims. Shut. This is shutting back doors that these cyber actors install on networks and systems. In the first of its kind operation, we use technical of capability and court authority to shut back doors that Chinese cyber actors placed on hundreds of US computers. Take down. We coordinated a global operation to disrupt a go-to service for cyber criminals, the Emotet botnet, which criminals used to gain access to more than a million computers worldwide and then sell that access to others, including ransomware actors and unlock. This is unlocking and decrypting ransomware affected computers, which we'll talk about a little later when we get into ransomware. We've really put a lot of thought into our cyber operations to ensure that they're joint and sequenced for maximum impact. And we do this by working with all of our partners across the US government, abroad, with providers, and with the private sector. Next slide, please. So cyber crime trends, I think actually, I might have skipped, yeah, back one. Oh, okay. I think, okay, well, could you go to the IC3 slide, please? The next one. Next. You might have to go forward and then back. So next, next. Okay. Bear with me. We're going to go forward and then backwards. <laughs> so this is one of the great capabilities that the FBI has, and it's called IC3, which is the Internet Crime Complaint Center. And it provides a reliable and convenient mechanism for the public to report suspected internet facilitated crimes. It also is a repository for public reporting where you can see different alerts and reports that the IC3 puts out, including an annual report with trends and pardon me, statistics. Since its inception in 2000, the IC3 has received over 6 million complaints and is on track to receive over 1 million in 2021. You can see the 2021 report on IC3's website soon. It's not available yet, but that'll have all the latest updates, all the statistics and reporting that's been to IC3. You can see on the right-hand side of this, uh, we talk about the recovery asset team, which was created in 2018 for the FBI to follow money that's been stolen from victims and in plenty instances, freeze it and seize it. And I'll talk more about this because this is a really important piece of information that I don't know that everybody is aware of, but. You've seen in the news how the FBI has clawed back money that has been paid for in ransomware, but we've been doing this for a long time. And this is blocking criminal cyber, cyber criminals proceeds and not just ransomware, but in other cyber crimes. In 2020 alone, the recovery asset team stopped over 380 million that was stolen from individuals and pulled it back. That's an 82% success rate of the money that was stolen to what was recovered. 82% is, is pretty significant. And since 2018, when this recovery asset team was started, we've recovered over 830 million. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can initiate that process. So um, next slide. Um, can you actually go back to the cyber crimes trend, cyber crime trend slide? Yeah, I think maybe we're back on track now. So these are the trends that you'll see in the IC3 annual report. These are all growing problem areas. Tech support and elder fraud are growing areas. I won't get into those. Ransomware, we're going to talk about later, but I wanted to spend a little time on business email compromise. I think it gets overshadowed by ransomware, which undoubtedly is a growing and morphing threat, but business email compromise or BEC is the top crime type by victim loss. So in 2020, IC3 received almost 20,000 complaints with 1.8 billion in losses. That's billion with a B compared to ransomware, which is 20, 29, 29 million. So 1.8 billion versus 29 million. Now, granted, this is just what's been reported to IC3. And we already know that there's an underreporting going on, especially in terms of ransomware, but it gives you an idea of the scale of business email compromise. 
And IC3 has observed an increase in business email compromise complaints related to identity theft and then funds being converted to cryptocurrency. So in these type of scams, victims are targeted in non-BEC situations with like extortion, tech support, or romance scams. They're encouraged to give forms of ID to the bad guys, and then the bad guys then use that ID to create fraudulent bank accounts to funnel funds into and then convert to cryptocurrency. Next slide. So this gets into really what goes into a business email compromise. And you may be thinking like, I'm a lawyer, why do I really care about this? And it's because you may have to advise your clients on this, and you may want to help situate your clients to be poised to respond to BEC to protect against it. You have to think about, are they acting in such a way that they're taking sufficient cybersecurity measures that align with representations they've made to shareholders and regulators? So by you understanding the lay of the land, you can help be a better advisor to your client. So some quick facts about BEC, I mean, they target attack through these two mechanisms, social engineering and malware. And I won't really get into the details of it other than to say a lot of this relies on manipulation of the intended victim. So once they get to the victim, either by these two avenues, they'll encourage the victim to transfer funds to a fraudulent bank account or protect perhaps a false invoice. And then once they're intercepted, they're directed to cyber criminal accounts and then rendered um, untraceable and unusable by, via cryptocurrency mixing services and tumblers. Next slide. This just goes to show you that the BEC network um, is a complex one. Well, it doesn't seem complex, but it does. It has multiple layers to it. It really does take a village in not the good way for these criminal networks to operate. And very often, one will specialize in a certain aspect of it and pay another cyber criminal to perform the other aspect. So it becomes a very uh, efficient enterprise. Next slide. So defending and responding, it's really important. There's a lot more to these particular bullets, but I'll just say that defending, you wanna have proper training of your employees. I think Bob really hit, hit it earlier when he said, these are the, the first line. If it just takes one employee to click a link to provide that ingress into your computer system. One of the most important things for BEC prevention is to verify payment changes. If you get a request to change wiring instructions, you really need to stop and think, and you need to verify, and that's not through email, that's through a phone call to someone that you already have an established relationship with, or better yet, meeting in person somehow to confirm these changes. If, it, if they give you new bank account information, does that resolve to a bank that you know they're usually using? And use technical tools like intrusion detection systems and email authentication protocols. And finally, Responding, you know, contact the originating financial institution, request a wire recall or reversal, and file a detailed complaint at IC3.gov within 48 hours. This is the way to initiate that recovery asset team that I mentioned with the 82% success rate. I mean, that's how we can freeze and get your money back. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So this is always a priority for the FBI, engaging with you. And I really appreciate this opportunity to be here because this is how we build a better and more secure cyber ecosystem. And I know you're here for a much more in the weeds legal education, which you're gonna get from my colleagues here. I'm hoping to set some practical foundation and some technical foundation for you as you move forward and do that. You know, I come from an in-house counsel role from before the FBI. And I know that having that legal, ba that technical basis makes you a more knowledgeable and helpful advocate for your client. Lawyers should always be part of these conversations with the C-suite, board of directors, CISOs, and others advising in advance on these topics, creating incident response playbooks, table topping things out, and then being part of the conversation when there is an event. You know, lawyers are typically asked, should I engage with law enforcement? I'm biased. I mean, I think the answer is yes, <laughs> but, I, but I wanna tell you there are lots of benefits to doing that. So first of all, by sharing information with us, you help us connect the dots to understand what cyber actors may be doing broadly, what they may be planning in the future so we can help you prevent attacks and mitigate them. We can learn about perpetrators, tools, tactics, and techniques and get these valuable insights that we then share with you. And we support you in your data breach response. I mean, under some state laws, law enforcement may be able to temporarily delay otherwise mandatory state data breach reporting when law enforcement determines that it advances investigative goals. Now that's a law enforcement decision, but working with us can help us make that decision. Proactive reporting to law enforcement may help your organization deal with regulators, which have looked favorably upon entities that cooperate with the government in an investigation. And we'll talk about the civil cyber fraud initiative a little bit later where this comes into play. 
And if an incident becomes public, cooperation may shrink in your organization's position with shareholders, insurers, lawmakers, and the media. So this is my next slide, my last slide. So if you remember one thing, it's about time. I mean, engage with us early before an incident. Report intrusions quickly. If you have one, we can be there within hours. Across the country, across the world, we can be there within a day in over 70 countries. And the recovery asset team can help you recover your funds if you report within 48 hours. And third, it's never too late to reach out. This is what we're here for. It's, I implore you to, to contact your local field office or any other FBI agent, uh, agent that you have a relationship with. Because cyber risk is business risk and cybersecurity is national security. And the only way that we can address this risk is together. So I will leave it now for my more capable colleagues to cover the substance of the latest cyber developments, but I wanted to stop here and on behalf of the FBI, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. Thank you so much, Kristen, really helpful. And I, I think that does set the stage for kind of getting into the legal weeds as you described. Um, we're gonna turn now to the executive order that came out last May on improving the nation's cybersecurity. Um, this is executive order 14028. So up on the screen here, I've listed the various sections. It's, it's a relatively long executive order um, with a lot of different initiatives. Um, it calls for various publications from certain agencies, as well as um, different modernization efforts within the federal government. Um, so I've highlighted the, the first three sections there, sections two, three, and four, um, which really I think are going to have the most direct impact on federal contractors. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the initiatives and um, proposed regulations that we're likely to see under those sections. But I want to make sure that, that we, we discuss the totality of the executive order as well. Um, you'll see there section five calls for the establishment of a cyber safety review board to review certain um, significant cyber incidents. There are various internal government initiatives, such as a playbook relating to cyber vulnerabilities and threats, um, and other initiatives within government to make sure that there's early detection and identification of various issues and vulnerabilities. Um, I'll also highlight section nine. There was a, a memorandum out of the White House last week, I believe, that um, touches on this national security systems and updates relating to cyber for those types of systems. Next slide, please. Yeah, and Townsend, I would just add one quick point on that playbook. Um, so even though the playbook is focused on the federal incident response, it's a really helpful benchmark for private industry to consider just to do a bit of a gut check, compare sort of the themes, the flow of how the actual incident response process would play out and make sure that you're at least aligned, particularly with what your government customers are gonna be expecting of themselves and potentially of you. Right, I think that's a great point. And, and as with um, the various publications we'll discuss today, um, even if they are not requirements for contractors or directly aimed at contractors, I think Kate makes a good point that they are certainly um, great guidance documents for contractors and, and may someday become requirements as we kind of see how these new developments play out within the federal government. And, and they certainly could be passed to contractors through um, various contract provisions um, from individual agencies. So yeah, not to discredit any of the other sections there, we'll highlight these and then kind of talk through the rest. So focusing on section two, um, which is titled sharing threat information. Um, this section really uh, dovetails a lot with what Kristen was talking about and initiatives within the federal government to make sure that information from the private sector is shared so that FBI, CISA, various other government agencies are able to understand and combat cyber threats and incidents as quickly as possible. Um, so the three main initiatives under section two, I have listed on the slide here, um, removing contractual barriers for service providers, um, specifically the executive order mentions IT, OT and cloud providers, um, that they should be sharing threat and cyber incident information. Um, one of the issues that was discussed, um, which was the impetus partially for this executive order, in addition to solar winds and some of the other um, incidents that Bob discussed earlier, um, were contract provisions that prohibit in certain circumstances or limit the ability of service providers and vendors to share information. Um, so this executive order calls for an end to, to those contractual barriers. The executive order also states a policy that ICT service providers must promptly report cyber incidents. Um, and there is also an initiative discussed within section two that within the federal government, and I, I believe CISA has stated that they've already reviewed hundreds and hundreds of contract provisions to try to standardize and streamline so that um, 
contractors, and I'm sure those of you listening know, you may have myriad obligations under your contracts relating to cybersecurity that are not always consistent. Um, so there is an effort called for under this executive order to streamline and make those contract clauses somewhat more consistent. Next slide, please. So as of right now, there are two open FAR cases on the books relating to section two of the executive order. Um, we have the numbers up here on the slide and they relate to those three initiatives I just discussed. The first open FAR case 2021-19 relates to standardizing cybersecurity requirements for unclassified federal information systems. Um, so I'm interested in, in the panel's thoughts on this, but, but my thought is, you know, we've seen over the past several years, DOD taking a more proactive approach to regulations in this space, um, requiring NIST 800-171 controls for protecting controlled unclassified information in contractor systems. Um, so we're, I think we're likely to see um, an extension of that through this FAR, FAR case um, and likely in alignment with NARA's uh, CUI rule and program that's been out for several years now, but hasn't actually been implemented through a FAR clause. I'll jump in just for a second. You know, it's kind of an oddity that the DOD has moved out for so many years to have contract clauses, the DFARS 252-204-7012, which say that every contractor that has that clause has to deliver adequate security in a dy dynamic environment relying upon that NIST uh, special publication that Townsend mentioned. And yet there's been no counterpart for the civilian agencies, any of them. And does that mean that adversaries won't take CUI from contractors for civilian agencies? No. Does it mean that contractors don't have CUI in the work for civilian agencies? Of course they do. I mean, I think it's been wariness of, in a sense, extending the problems experienced with DOD's rule to an even larger universe of contractors. And yet, I think it's coming because, you know, the truth is that we've suffered many billions of dollars in exfiltration of valuable data. And although 171 is, is not you know, the best way to protect against ransomware and more aggressive threats, it's at least a sound baseline. So my personal view is that I would expect that we'll see some rulemaking out this year that would extend those basic requirements broadly across the universe of civilian contractors. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think we've all just been waiting for something like a FAR CUI clause to drop. And there are a lot of folks who took note of that provision within section two and said, perhaps this is the push that we need to finally get things across the finish line and get a little bit more uniformity. Because as we all know, DOD is one ball of wax, but on the civilian side, you've got so much variety and it makes it really hard. And I think another thing that hopefully the streamlining process will clarify, there's still a lot of discussion about, well, what's CUI, what's CDI, what's DOD CUI, and a lot of that stems from sort of the, the DOD first rollout of all of this. So hopefully we'll get a lot of clarity coming out of the CEO. Yes, I think that two great points. And yes, the clarity would be a good thing. I know there's been um, a lot of consternation among the government contracting community about that point Kate just raised. What is CUI? How do we identify it? How do we make sure we're properly protecting it? Um, so we're likely to see that, I, as you can see on that, the final bullet on this slide, if you go to the report of open FAR cases right now, it, it does have a due date of February 2nd for draft proposed rules. We'll see if that holds. Um, usually these things push out, um, but that is what is, has been posted, at least at the time I put these slides together a few days ago. Um, so the other open FAR case, 2021-17. This combines those two initiatives on the previous slide relating to cyber incident and cyber threat reporting, um, both for IT and OT service providers, as well as ICT service providers. Um, again, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this is rolled out. Um, right now, as most of you probably know, within the DFARS-7012 clause, there is that subsection that says, if you're using an external cloud service provider, you need to make sure that they meet the FedRAMP moderate baseline or equivalent. Um, but DOD has said that, that you are not necessarily going to be flowing down the Dash 7012 clause to that cloud provider. Um, so I think here we're going to run into that same scenario where you may have service providers and vendors that you're not traditionally flowing down FAR or DFARS provisions to, but you're going to have an obligation to make sure that those vendors understand their reporting obligations. Well, I'll jump in really quickly to say first that your next slide focuses on the problem because it talks about the executive order's emphasis on going to cloud solutions for federal agencies and departments. And that 
recent memorandum from the president about national security systems emphasizes the same thing. Move to the cloud, do zero trust. We'll talk about zero trust a little bit later. It's rather difficult to do with a premises system. And yet, you know, the truth is we're, we're encouraging federal agencies and department to move to the cloud and then to use some advanced technology to improve uh, the security of those systems. And yet we really haven't made that, we haven't made that align well. We haven't reconciled those initiatives what's with what is in CMMC or the current set of contract requirements. Right, that's a great point. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, as Bob alluded to, so, so moving on, this section relates to section three of the executive order, which focuses on moder modernizing federal government cybersecurity. Um, so here are just listed a few of the initiatives relating to that section of the EO. Um, as Bob mentioned, it calls for the federal government to prioritize cloud solutions where possible. Um, it, it mandates in certain circumstances that the federal government move towards zero trust architecture. Um, as well as adopt multi-factor authentication and encryption. And there is also a provision in the executive order calling for the government to modernize FedRAMP. Um, I assume most people on this call know FedRAMP, but the, this is the uh, Federal Risk and Authorization Ma Man Management Program. Thank you, Kate. Um, and it's the federal government's program for authorizing cloud service providers at various levels, depending on the, the sensitivity of data and the security required. Um, so, the federal government is looking to automate the process. Sometimes it's difficult for cloud service providers to get authorized to find a sponsoring agency um, and to get through the, through the process within a, a short period of time. So there will be initiatives to modernize FedRAMP as well. Um, and I don't wanna bore anybody too much, but I wanna make sure that you're aware that with, throughout the executive order, there are um, requirements that certain agencies put out publications and um, those have been rolling out over the last year. Um, so we've been tracking those pretty closely um, and just for you on the phone um, to make sure that you understand that there has been a federal zero trust strategy that was put out by OMB last year in September. Um, CISA also put out a zero trust maturity model document, as well as a cloud security technical reference architecture document. Um, so for those of you that are interested, those are publicly available online. Um, quick Google search, we'll, we'll pull them up and any one of us here is also happy to point you to those if you're interested. Um, FedRAMP also has been putting out materials as well. They put out a new authorization boundary guidance document um, for those of you that are cloud providers. And FedRAMP is also in the process of updating its baselines to align with the new NIST 853 revision five publication. Um, and, and relatedly too, just I think last week, DOD put out a new draft version of its security requirements guide for cloud computing uh, providers. So a lot going on, um, a lot to follow, but just be aware that there are documents out there that, are, that have been published. Um, as Kate mentioned, most of these are guidance right now. They're aimed at the federal government, but they are certainly useful for contractors so as well. One of the big questions is, you know, this is very ambitious stuff. It's going to cost the federal government a lot of money to do it itself. And it would be an oddity if the federal government were to so greatly improve its security through these strategies and techniques and not to encourage in some fashion or even mandate that contractors adopt them. This is not simple stuff and it will take time and money for the commercial world as well as the government. So we need to be thinking about you know, how you can encourage your, your companies as they plan ahead to follow the lead as is suggested in the executive order and, and through its implementation. Yeah, and on that point, it's also helpful to keep in mind, just for being a private sector commercial entity, these are all really good best practices to consider. And you think about situations where you might be on the defensive side, you might have the plaintiff's bar pointing to a lack of reasonableness, for example, in your security measures. And you look at things like multi-factor authentication and encryption, something that folks have struggled mightily with over the years, because as you said, Bob, they're hard things to do. They're tough to implement. They take time, they take resources. But this is another example of something that is sort of put on a pedestal to say, at this point, they're non-negotiable for the federal government. And at some point, someone's gonna hold the private sector accountable to follow suit. Well, you make a great point. I don't wanna to take too much time here, but you make <laughs> a really great point, And that is the changing standard of care. Right. I mean, a couple of years ago, the best argument to anybody who might claim to sue you for a cyber breach was, how did, how could I know what was the best practice? Nobody can actually do this. It's all a mystery. And, and therefore, there is no standard of due care, no matter how stupid I was. 
you know, you can't show that I acted with negligence or you can't show I violated some regulatory obligation or duty to shareholders. I think that is changing. And I think private enforcement will come to play a, a much bigger role for defense contractors and other companies, you know, who are exposed in the event that they are attacked and their business is interrupted or other damages occur. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and particularly where we're talking about government contractors, where, where we do have, at least in some circumstances, those NIST standards that we're required to comply with, you may not be looked at so favorably if you're not compliant in other areas as well. Next slide. Uh, turning now to section four of the executive order, this, this is a big section. It might be the longest section in the entire executive order. Um, it focuses on uh, software supply chain security and secure software development. Um, this dovetails nicely with what Bob just said. This is a very ambitious section. Um, it tasks NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, with um, putting out multiple iterations of guidance documentation, a definition of what constitutes critical software, um, and various other publications to ensure that within the federal government and contractors that, that there is some sort of um, guidance and process for how to go about developing software in a way that's secure. And as you can imagine, this is in direct response to some of the incidents that we've seen over past years where there's been a vulnerability embedded in software that then gets exploited um, over a wide range of companies and government agencies. Well, I, I expect this one has to find its way into mandates or strong encouragement for contractors because Log4j, which emerged just a couple of weeks ago, kept the security types working overnight, you know, 24 seven for weeks and it is far from abated. And that was uh, essentially a, a, an ordinary logging program that's produced by the Apache organization that's been in use in tens of thousands of circumstances, open source software, that somebody was able to corrupt and use it to literally take over your entire system, take all your information and do anything they wanted with it if that was the attack that they chose. Well, I mean, this has put not the spotlight, the laser light on, on software security. And so there's gonna be tremendous interest in this idea of a software bill of material so that you know more about the providers to your software and the participants, the providence and the components. If there is a vulnerability, you'd like to know it real fast, know whether you have it in your system and it, know how to patch it quickly. If you're just left guessing, you just remain vulnerable. Right, and, and I think this is a big one that will be difficult for some companies as well. Um, you know, if you haven't been tracking this in detail over time, it's, it's gonna be something that, you know, it's gonna require a revision to processes and policies and, and how you're developing um, software as an organization. Another key point on this section is it does call for the FAR to be updated. Um, no, it would be no earlier than a year after the executive order came out. So at the earliest May of this year, um, but the executive order does contemplate that software developers that are contractors are going to have to provide some sort of attestation that they're complying um, with new requirements. And those requirements are gonna be based on the, the guidance that we're seeing out of NIST. Um, another key point on section four at the end, it does call on NIST to develop criteria for a consumer labeling program for software and Internet of Things devices. Um, I, I've attended a couple of meetings where the NIST and, and other organizations and individuals have talked about this, and it does seem like this is also going to be a pretty heavy lift. Um, again, the executive order calls for development of criteria. Um, as far as I know so far, they're contemplating that this will be a voluntary program, um, but we'll see how that develops over time. Next slide. So this includes the timeline that, that NIST has put out um, relating to section four of the executive order for secure software development. For the most part, they, they've stayed, I believe, on target with these. So publications have been coming out now um, for the past six to eight months. So we do now have a definition of critical software that was published over the summer. Um, we also have several guidance documents that NIST put out on sec a secure software development framework, um, minimum elements for an SBOM, and various other publications, which are, are also all available on NIST's website. Um, so if you're in this space, I would encourage you to review those um, and probably start trying to implement some of these um, guidelines into your practices within your organization. So it goes back to me, and since we're a little behind schedule, I'm going to try to go through ransomware quickly. It's an impossible subject for the entire week 
it is so big. It is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. No one is exempt. And in truth, you know, there's so much attention paid to government contractors and DOD contractors in particular. But ransomware criminals are not particularly discriminating. They'll go after DOD contractors or, or anybody else. So, you know, we have to come to grips with this new reality. You know, we first heard of ransomware, next slide. We first heard of ransomware, you know, when um, a, a hacker would encrypt your database and you would pay them in cryptocurrency, uh, in which case they would give you the key back. You know, the next stage was a double extortion where they would both encrypt your data, but steal it beforehand and then threaten to expose it to your, to publicly on the dark web or otherwise provide it to your competitors. And now there's a triple form of extortion, which essentially is where the ransomware criminal does both of the things above. But if you're a little slow to come to the table, not offering enough, they essentially remain the, retain the ability to stop your system from functioning at all. And all of these have many examples of where they've been employed globally. And although you know, the individual numbers of ransomware paid maybe are relatively sl small compared to other breach consequences, the impacts upon organizations that are subject to a ransomware attack can be devastating. And we have to appreciate that this has spawned a gigantic, complex criminal enterprise as is shown by that uh, chart that I took from CrowdStrike that's on the right. And you know, we know, we've known for some time that nation states such as Russia can host or accommodate uh, ransomware attackers. Sometimes they will police them. But it's increasingly clear that nation states can use ransomware or even do it themselves for you know, their pro geopolitical purposes. And this you know, essentially makes it a national security threat, in my view. It's not just a threat to your business, it's a threat to your supply chain. It's a threat, it's a threat to your customers. And depending on where the ransomware attack goes, it could have consequences to national security. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through the particulars, but if you think about it, if you're a government contractor and you get hit with a double extortion threat and you decide not to pay, you may no longer have access to the controlled and classified information that you need to perform your contract. And if you lose all that COI, meaning that you have suffered a cyber incident, which you're obliged to report, well, it is certainly possible that the government, even the FBI, may want to look into exactly how did this happen? And were you taking measures that were appropriate given whatever the standard of care is today? Moreover, you know, we have to face the fact that even if you um, are only delayed in your, in your business operations, you, know, you can have trouble performing on time uh, if you're not able to access your information system or your information. Moreover, there is literally a laundry list of other responsibilities and liabilities that can follow a ransomware attack. Next slide. Now, I just put together a short list of them and you can go, go over them at your leisure. But you know, apart from the fact that you may have to pay ransom itself, which gets into all kinds of reporting and potentially violation issues with the OFAC unit of treasury and FinCEN, there are enormous direct costs just to respond and recover and then you can be facing liability from third parties whose information was compromised. I know of an example client that I've, I've assisted where you know, they were a victim of the Acelion uh, ransomware attack and their proprietary data was made public and they suffered some commercial injury because of the ransomware attack upon somebody that was helping host their files. Well, you know, they and others have contemplated and some have brought legal actions essentially looking to recover some of their business damage you know, by reason of a ransomware attack on a trusted source. Well, one of the things we've learned over the course of the year is that you really can't trust anybody, no matter how long they've been good, no matter how careful they are. Everybody thought of solar winds as a trusted intermediary. Well, no more. I mean, I think it's true that, that even the best, you know, the strongest cloud service providers, even there, there is exposure. Next slide. I think we're, we're off to, let's go two slides forward. No, one, sorry, with that slide. Over to Kristen. So I won't go into too many details. I think Bob covered a lot of this very nicely. And the most common types of infections are listed there on the left-hand side. But again, I, I won't go into those. What I do want to focus on are the numbers and the trends. And ransomware definitely demonstrates what our cyber division deputy assistant director, Tonya Ugaretz, called a concerning combination of stealth and audaciousness from actors. 
You can see this in the ransomware numbers and in the tactics that are using that Bob already talked about. But in terms of numbers, in 2020, the number of incidents grew by 20%, but the monetary losses grew by over 225% to 29 million. And again, that's just what's been reported to IC3. And in 2021, the numbers are expected to continue to increase, currently seeing over a 60% increase in reporting. So the 2021 numbers aren't final, but they will be soon. But all of it is showing just exponential growth and these concerning tactics that the ransomware actors are using. You'll likely be advised as legal counsel to you know, advise your C-suite and board of directors to help prepare for an incident like this beforehand in your incident response playbook crafting and tabletop exercises. FBI does not recommend paying ransom. And you know, there's many reasons for that. I've listed some of them here. It doesn't guarantee that you'll regain access to your data. You can pay and then it will not be decrypt decrypted. And just recently, a US company filed for bankruptcy after their data was encrypted. They paid for it. It wasn't decrypted and they had to file for chapter 11 bankruptcy. It emboldens the adversary to retarget you, increase the ransom demands and funds further illicit activity. And Bob already mentioned OFAC where it, you could be paying an OFAC sanctioned entity and you could be held strictly liable for this, whether you know it's a sanctioned entity or not. So you have to be really careful when you make these decisions and when you advise your clients on how to make these decisions. Next slide, please. So turning now to supply chain risk management, we've touched on this several times already and the importance of making sure that you understand your supply chain, um, particularly from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, Kristen and, and Bob, I believe, have already mentioned the specific foreign adversaries that we've seen, um, you know, come up time and time again in the NDAAs and, and the specific countries that we're focused on making sure that we can um, address in terms of cyber threats. So I'll, I'll go through some of these. I think we're seeing more of a focus within the last four to five years on trying to identify specific sources, articles, countries. Um, from which we think there may be a cyber threat and, and figuring out how to combat those. Um, we saw that in the 2018 NDAA with a, a now what is a FAR provision on prohibiting use of products and software from Kaspersky Labs. Um, and then again in, in NDAA uh, 2019 based on Section 889, which I'll talk about a little bit um, in more detail just because this has been a key area, I think, for a lot of contractors over the last few years. And then we'll go into a couple more supply chain risk initiatives as well. Um, so Section 889 um, came out of the NDAA. This is the provision that prohibits the federal government from contracting with contractors that sell or use covered telecommun telecommunications equipment or services. Um, that is defined as equipment and services from five named Chinese entities, including Huawei and ZTE. Um, the definition also includes any subsidiary or affiliate of those entities, which, as you can imagine, could be a very long list of companies. Um, the government hasn't given us, and, and I don't know that they could because it's probably constantly evolving, um, but a complete list of what all those entities are. So that has been a challenge for contractors in trying to comply with these provisions. Um, there is also um, within the definition the ability of the Secretary of Defense in consultation with certain other individuals to name other entities that could fall under this prohibition. Um, so we haven't seen that yet, but it is written into the, the section and the FAR rule that came out of this section. An important point to keep in mind is this implies to all contracts and contractors, there's no exception for small businesses, um, for commercial items, micro purchase threshold, um, acquisitions under the micro purchase threshold. So this is something that really has impacted the entire government contracting community. Next slide. If I could just add in on that cost point, I, I know that that, at least in my experience, I've seen a lot of frustration over the lack of some sort of exemption and sort of the broad applicability. And one of the things that is at least helpful to keep in mind to sort of take the temperature down a bit on that topic is that by having these sort of broad applicability measures without those exemptions, it is really getting at the fundamental purpose of these requirements, which is to ensure that we're not inadvertently injecting risk into our information systems. And COTS in particular is a huge mechanism for us to ensure that we are providing those services as well as using them ourselves. So it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but it really is, it is justified by the intent of the requirements there. Yeah. So, so I just saw a note, Kate, that you are hard to hear. So you might want to try to move your microphone maybe a little closer. All we right. can adjust the volume. Thank you for the 
point of the semester. <laughs> so uh, I think hopefully everyone could hear Kate's point, which was a great one that that this um, applicability to cost providers has caused a lot of frustration, but it is something that really fortifies the intent behind this rule and the reason why it's there. Um, and we'll probably get into this a little more later that COTS are, for the most part, now exempt from some of the other cybersecurity regs. So there's a little bit of, um, you know, if you are a COTS provider, figuring out what does and does not apply to you. Um, I'll quickly move through Section 889. Um, there are two parts to it. Part A is, is a prohibition on contractors supplying up through their supply chain to the federal government, this prohibited telecom. Um, there are new FAR provisions relating to, to the Section 889, which I have cited on the slide here. Um, one of the FAR provisions is a representation provision that you represent um, that you will not supply any covered telecom. Um, there are very, very limited exceptions, um, which we don't even usually really talk about because they're not really applied at all. Um, but there is a representation provision here and also important to note within the FAR clause, the Dash 25 clause, there is a reporting requirement if you discovered covered telecom um, within your supply chain during contract performance. And there is a one business day uh, reporting period for that. Next slide. Part B relates to contractor use of covered telecom. And th this was a big deal when this first came out. Um, it became effective in August of 2020. Um, again, both Part A and Part B were still operating under interim rules that are in effect. Um, but many comments were submitted in response to the interim rules and final rules are still expected. So there is some clarity we may still be getting on this, which, which would be nice, I know, for certain companies. Um, but this Part B is a big deal because it really says if you are a federal government prime contractor, you may not use any of the covered telecom products or services within your operations, regardless of whether they tie directly to a federal government contract. Um, it requires a reasonable inquiry into the contractor's use of any covered telecom. So um, the, the guidance that came out with Part B says, you know, you don't have to go far and wide and, and search, um, you know, do a formal audit, but you do need to perform a reasonable inquiry of materials within your possession to determine whether or not you use any of the covered telecom. There, as with Part A, there's a representation relating to Part B that contractors are required to um, complete that says whether or not you will or will not use covered telecom. Um, there is also a reporting requirement of one business day with regard to part B. Um, the important thing here too, I mentioned it applies to federal prime contractors. It is not part of the mandatory flow down. So part A, the restriction on supplying covered telecom up through the federal government is a mandatory flow down to be passed on to subcontractors. Part B, however, is not. Um, and then the final bullet there, uh, we do have final rules pending. And currently um, on the report of open bar cases, there is a report that's gonna be coming out this month. But again, we'll see if that um, holds true or not. But stay tuned for final rules on section 889. Next slide. Another major supply chain um, risk initiative out of the federal government is the Federal Acquisition Supply Chain Security Act and the related council. Um, an interim rule came out in September of 2020. We got a final rule in August of last year um, relating to the processes by which the FASC can review and evaluate certain covered articles and entities um, for security risk. So the ability of the council to um, determine whether or not, as with Section 889, potential articles or sources pose such a threat to our federal supply chain, um, that they should be eliminated or um, the threats otherwise need to be mitigated. Next slide. So the, the rule itself um, provides the processes. So far, there have not been any named articles or entities, um, but we do have a process now for doing that. Um, agencies are to submit information regarding substantial supply chain risk for review. Um, the rule also contemplates that non-federal entities can voluntarily submit information regarding threats that can be reviewed. The rule has um, 10 non-exclusive factors that can be used by the FAST when evaluating supply chain risk. Some of those relate to whether or not um, the, the potentially covered article or entity has access to certain data or system privileges, what the security and integrity um, of that source looks like, whether or not there are any ownership um, or control by a foreign government that relates to the article or entity, 
um, and also the ability of uh, data to be transmitted outside of the US. So those are just some of the factors that the FAST may look at when evaluating supply chain risk under this rule. Um, they can recommend exclusion of the article or entity from federal procure procurement and, and from use within the supply chain um, or other mitigation measures. Um, there's also uh, provisions within the final rule for potential waivers. So this is something to keep an eye on. As I said, we don't have any identified articles or entities at this point, but it is another mechanism by which the government is trying to um, address significant supply chain risk and, and threats. Next slide. So another interim rule that we saw recently um, comes out of commerce, and this relates to an executive order on securing the ICT supply chain from cyber espionage. And this relates to review of ICT's transactions with between US persons and foreign adversaries. So the interim rule itself allows for commerce review of those transactions to see whether or not they pose an undue or unacceptable risk. Um, it also allows for the potential blockage or mitigation measures to be put in place in order to make the transactions less of a threat to U.S. security. Um, so this is another way in which we're seeing the cybersecurity supply chain and, and those foreign adversaries, those different concepts coming together in a way that we hope we can use to review and, and curb these significant threats. Next slide. And then finally, on supply chain risk management, I've just put in a couple um, additional sources just for um, guidance and also just for information on various initiatives. So the NIST publication here, NIST 800-161, a draft revision came out in October of last year. And this is actually a much more lengthy um, document relating to cybersecurity, supply chain risk management, um, and how to identify, assess, and mitigate those types of threats. Um, Appendix F of this publication relates specifically to the executive order I talked about earlier in section four on secure software development. Um, so this is a publication that is, is worth reviewing. Um, we're going to see, I think, more and more focus in contracts and out of agencies on cybersecurity supply chain risk management, risk management plans, um, and, and really contractor efforts to show the government that you're taking this seriously and have written policies and plans in place. Um, there are also various sections of the NDAA, as I mentioned, 2018, 2019, Section 889, um, but various sections that do focus on curbing threats from foreign adversaries, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, um, and also limiting U.S. reliance on certain articles and certain products from those companies. Um, I won't go through all of those now, but there certainly were several within the most recent NDAA um, and the 2021. I have on here um, from the 2019 NDAA section 1655, which um, there is an open DFARS case right now that hasn't uh, come into play quite yet. And, and we'll see how long it takes if, if ever, but it would require disclosure to DOD in certain circumstances if you allow your source code to potentially be reviewed by a foreign government or person. So this is another, another effort to really address um, secure software development and to make sure that software is not going to be under the influence of a foreign adversary. I have a quick comment. So, you know, SP 800-161 is a very thoughtful, thorough document. Even in its original version, it was long and complex. It's intended for agencies. The new REV um, is longer and more complex. Well, there's no counterpart, though, on supply chain risk management to NIST Special Publication 800-171. That's the document that has 110 requirements that contractors are supposed to use for cybersecurity. Now, the last couple of years have shown all too vividly that supply chain risks are exploited to great damage to the national interest. And yet there really is no clause anywhere today that tells any contractor that they must meet any, any established requirement or standard for manage, even knowing, much less managing their supply chain risk? Well, you know, there's a couple of reasons. One is that supply chain risk is context dependent. I mean, literally at any supplier, the risk would be different and the better answers would be different. But I expect this is an area where we'll see the federal government looking to find ways to, to look at um, the, the, your supply chain risk management plan, just as you suggested. Uh, there's been a couple of instances, uh, instances, I think three from GSA, 
where the RFP has said, we'd like to, to know, you know your plan for supply chain risk management. We're gonna evaluate that. You know, presumably they might have some reason to take a look at your actual accomplishments in supply chain uh, risk management. And I would extend that, expect that principle will extend because of the you know, many harms that have been experienced by you know, porous supply chains. Yeah, and sort of, again, beating that same drum to the extent that you see something like that in your RFP, being able to benchmark off of something like this NIST standard is right. going to be really helpful for you. Well, that's a big problem because, you know, right now there's all, there's, you know, standard everywhere you look. I mean, there are ISO standards and open group standards. There's a lot of useful stuff out there, but, you know, a NIST standard is something that, that is established by the NIST unit of the Department of Commerce they tend to be dominant in you know, federal contracting and in, the, and in the actions of federal departments and agencies. I don't really see that 161 in any version is translatable to many contractors because of its you know, arduous complexity. I think we're gonna need something that is not prescriptive, not rule driven, but you know, makes the point, gives you the points, you know, the waypoints, the milestones and the objectives to understand your supply chain risk and take acts to, to mitigate it. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, we're going to see more of a focus on that here. And I think we'll see the, the FAR cases and the DFARS cases that I briefly mentioned come into play and we'll hopefully be able to get some more clarity on those this year. Yeah. Over to you. Turn it over to Kate. All right. We had wanted to take a break here for questions, um, but we are shockingly behind schedule. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Um, so we're going to try really hard to save some time at the end. I know that we do have some in the Q&A, um, which unfortunately we haven't been able to see with just the way that the technology works, um, but we do see that there are questions. So let's jump to the next slide here because now we're gonna shift gears to everyone's favorite topic. We're gonna talk about CMMC. Bob previewed it a bit. Um, the long and short of it is that there've been a lot of changes here recently. Um, but just to level set first, we wanted to start out with what the current state of play is, because a lot of these clauses we've referenced throughout this discussion so far, a lot of them are also really relevant to understanding what the current CMMC 2.0 landscape looks like. So you've got your FAR basic safeguarding clause, it's been around since 2016, focused on protecting federal contractor information, I'm sorry, federal contract information, and its applicability is to those covered contractor systems. 7012, we can talk about that all day long, focused on protecting covered defense information, what the DOD is now more frequently referring to as DOD CUI. Um, that's got your adequate security requirements, your incident reporting, and then your flow down obligations. 7019 and 7020, we talked about those a little bit with last year's annual review. They had just come out with the interim rule that also introduced CMMC for the first time. This is really focused on adding a little bit of a, uh, some teeth in the verification mechanisms of 7012. The idea here is that before you can be eligible to be awarded a contract that involves the use of CDI, you're going to have to conduct at least your own self-assessment and submit that self-assessment to the Supplier Performance Risk System, SPURS. Um, again, that's gonna come into play when we talk a little bit more about CMMC, which is of course our favorite clause, 7021 down the bottom of the list here. We've all been waiting for it to get implemented. And the big news is, is that it's not gonna get implemented in the immediate future. We're still waiting for it to pan out. So let's talk about what it will ultimately look like. Jump to the next slide, please. Okay, so as we mentioned, the interim rule that introduced 7021 for the first time, that was published in November of 2020, um, if I'm recalling correctly. I've had some maternity leave in there, so all of the time frames get a little um, squiggly for me sometimes. It became effective in November. November, thank you. Um, and immediately we saw a lot of consternation to borrow Townsend's word um, within the industry. There's a lot of confusion um, and not a lot of proactive communication industry felt from the DOD about how this was actually going to roll out. Um, so in March, 2021, simultaneous with the Biden administration coming on board, um, the DOD initiated an internal assessment. Um, one of the primary objectives of that assessment was to really thoroughly evaluate the close to 1,000 comments. It was about, about 850 or so comments that the DOD received in response to the interim rule. 
Um, so we were all waiting on pins and needles with the expectation that the DOD would announce uh, whatever changes they would make in response to that assessment. And we saw that just a couple months ago in November of 2021. So they announced CMMC 2.0, and I often joke around that it's almost like the DOD accepted every single suggested revision <laughs> short of scrapping CMMC entirely. Um, but the idea there is that they're really trying to streamline the CMMC, both the requirements within them, but also the process to work through them and get that certification. So the big news here is that with the announcement of CMMC 2.0, the DOD also said that they are going to pause their pilot programs. There are going to be no contracts. Originally, we were thinking that there was going to be sort of this tiered rollout of CMMC 1.0. Um, there would be no pilot programs that would be the first where 7021 would be a condition to award. Instead, the rulemaking both to implement CMMC 2.0, as well as updates to 7021 in the DFARS, that would have to run its course first. The timeline is a pretty broad one, anywhere from nine to 24 months. And once those steps are complete, that's when 7021 in its newly revised form would start to get implemented in contracts. So one of the big questions that's come up is, you know, what do companies do in the interim? And you know, there are some people who say, well, I'm gonna wait until I see the final rules before I'll invest and, and act. And I don't think that's a smart move for a number of reasons. I mean, the threat landscape is not going to pause. You know, you're not gonna be uh, given an exemption or a free pass you know, from cyber threats, um, even if this rule takes another nine to 24 months. Also, you know, a couple of key clauses are already in place and remain in place. You mentioned 19 and 20, which require the self-assessment the submission of a score to SIPPERS and um, uh, you have to promise the date when you're gonna close any gaps. Well, those things are still in place. And, and even that submission arguably is a form of representation that you're making to the government as to your self-assessment, the score that you gave to yourself and um, when you're going to close your security gaps. So I, I, I still think that there is um, present powerful motivation and obligation to work towards uh, this, the point where you're confident when the assessments are ready and it is required of you that you will pass. Right. And along those same lines, I believe DOD is working on incentives for companies that do achieve CMMC or, or the requisite level of security in advance of the rulemaking becoming final. So those may be additional reasons in addition to the ones Bob gave to make sure that you're on the, the same track to get to compliance as soon as possible. Yeah, which just goes to show that the DOD knows that contractors are asking themselves exactly that question. And there's an entire ecosystem that has been spun up a lot of investment made in the CMMC process. And so the DOD's message is it's still valuable to prepare because it will eventually be a requirement. It just might look a little different than what you had anticipated. Um, so on the topic of those differences, let's jump to the next slide. So this is an overview of what CMMC 1.0 looked like. This is what we were all really familiar with. And just at a quick glance, you can see how complex the system was. You had five different levels, starting with one at the most basic to five at the most advanced. There were sort of two streams within each level. The first focused on actual cybersecurity practices that you were required to implement. And importantly, Bob mentioned POAMs, plans of action and milestones. Those were not going to be accepted. In order to pass your certification assessment, you needed to demonstrate that you had fully implemented all of the practices, again, with an increasing number, with an increasing level. The second stream, and this is another really important point when we move to what CMMC looks like now, was focused on maturity. That's sort of baked into the name, the cybersecurity maturity model certification. And there, the idea is that the assessor and therefore the DOD needed to assure themselves that you had all of the policies, processes, resources in place that could ensure and provide confidence that the snapshot in time about what your cybersecurity practices looked like, that those could be maintained, that that would not strictly be what you're doing today, but it's also what we could expect you're gonna be doing tomorrow. And like the practices, how they would increase over time, the maturity processes would get more thorough, more sophisticated as you move your way up that CMMC level. Quick, quick comment. So the original plan was that in order 
to, to get a government contract, once this uh, requirement showed up in, your, uh, in, an, in an RFP or in your contract or subcontract, that you're going to have to pass a certification either at uh, level one or at level three uh, and get that perfect 100% score. Um, theory was that you've had a couple of years already to comply with 171 through the 7012 clause and you ought to have this all done. Well, I mean, this, this turned CMMC not just into a gateway to better security, but potentially into a cliff that a large <laughs> number of companies were going to fall over. That never made a lot of sense, at least to me. But the original plan was that there would be 300,000 companies in the U.S. who would have to get an assessment. Well, it might take five years, you know, to get that applying to every, every company by, you know, by contract inclusion. But think of the apparatus, the ecosystem, you know, the, the, the cost of getting that done. I mean, I think ultimately DOD blinked I and mean, was just demanding too much applying to too many companies where the, the ratio you know, benefit to, to cost and burden, you know, seem to be skewed. Yeah, and that going back to the comments that were deliberated, that was an overwhelming theme. The costs associated with complying and maintaining compliance with CMMC and how those costs would translate down the supply chain and the impact to small and medium-sized businesses and the concern that that cliff would disproportionately affect that part of the supply chain, which is often underappreciated in terms of its importance. There are a lot of things that just can't happen without those folks further down in the lower tiers. So with all of those considerations at play and looking at this daunting mechanism that the DOD had originally envisaged, they switched to now 2.0. If we can jump to the next slide. This is a much cleaner model. So importantly, we've gone down from five levels to three. Originally, the concepts of levels two and four in CMMC 1.0 was really confusing because the DOD had said they never actually expected to include those as level requirements within solicitations. They were more uh, stepping stones for industry to use if you're trying to advance from level one to three or three to five. Those have been scrapped. They may still prove to be a useful benchmark as you yourselves are trying to look at advancing now from levels one to two or two to three, but it isn't formally a part of the CMMC process. So now you've got level one, which is focused still on situations where you have federal contract information. Level two is now focused on situations where you are handling controlled unclassified information. And level three are those situations where you have particularly sensitive programs that are more likely to be a target target of advanced persistent threats, those APT, very sophisticated actors. And so we need a higher level of cybersecurity sophistication to thwart them. Now, there are two big pieces here that we want to talk about. Um, the first is that although you can't see it visually on the slide, we talked about those two streams in the beginning. Um, when I say beginning, the 1.0 version. The second stream, the maturity process that has been dropped entirely from CMMC, yet it still maintains the maturity term in its name. So now the focus of CMMC is only on implementing those practices that are at play. Um, the other thing that's really interesting here, if you look at the last column here, when it's talking about the assessments. So everything around CMMC has been focused on this notion of a certified um, third party assessment organization, a C3PAO, who's going to be accredited, trained to come in and assess you the same way that they would assess your competitor um, and be sort of a trusted interim party for the DOD. That was expected to apply regardless of what level you were looking at. The, the types of things the assessor would be looking at would vary with the level, but the fact that you would have an assessor come on site and conduct the assessment was consistent throughout. That is a really big change now with 2.0. Level one, you see down the bottom right, you are now back to the self-assessment process, exactly what we had been working under with 7012 and what the DOD had pointed to as something that they thought was not sufficient to ensure compliance throughout the supply chain. Um, but the reality was that the third-party assessment model um, was not pal palpable, palatable enough for um, the majority, again, of those small and medium-sized businesses who were going to be subject to level one. Level two, it's now bifurcated. 
Um, depending on the sensitivity of the CUI that you're handling will determine whether or not you still go through that C3PAO assessment process, do it once, have to renew every three years, or if you are handling a lower level of sensitive CUI, the type of CUI, the example the DOD gave, something that might be necessary in order to provide um, military boots, some sort of combat uniforms, not something that's sort of weapon system grade CUI. Um, in those sorts of situations, then you're only going to be required to do a self-assessment, but that self-assessment needs to be done annually and it needs to be accompanied by an attestation by a senior company official. And then at the third level, level three, Instead of having the c pao assessment, you're now going to have a government-led assessment, and the DOD has said that that's going to be DIPTAC, the folks who have been undergoing voluntary assessments throughout this process where you have some reciprocity with the 7019 and 7020 requirements. So if we flip to the next slide, we'll see a little bit some of what's what's still there and what's different. And some of this, again, we've already talked about the maturity processes that's gone in CMMC 2.0. That is a big sigh of relief for a lot in industry because for many who were really comfortable with their cybersecurity practices, it was the processes that was proving to be a bit daunting to make sure they had fully rolled out and implemented. The C3PAO assessments for all certifications, that's narrower based on what we just said. The other thing, is there are no longer any requirements outside of two NIST publications. We've talked a lot about this special publication 800-171. That's what's applicable right now under 7012. That is what will be applicable for level two. Under CMMC 1.0, level two was the equivalent of level three, you were required to do not just those controls in the NIST 800-171, but also 20 additional controls that were brand new. The DOD had created those controls, um, pulling on themes from other standards out there, but really tailoring those controls to a DOD specific context. You saw that again at what was previously levels four and five, now is just level three. Those CMMC specific practices, that is, that is gone from, from CMMC. Um, part of the rationale behind it, many have, uh, many have expected, is because the DOD is trying to create something that is consistent for potential civilian adoption. Because NIST is something, again, it's a part of the Department of Commerce that's not specific to the DOD. The DOD has just opted to adopt the NIST standard. And so by removing the CMMC DOD tailored requirements, you're creating something that might be easier for the civilian side to adopt. Right, and I think that goes back to what we talked about associated with the executive order where the government is trying to standardize some of these cybersecurity obligations. Um, so we may see that this CMMC 2.0 will be better aligned with what we end up seeing at the civilian agencies. Um, well, we are getting alignment and we are getting consistency, but whether we're getting sufficiency in the controls, that's a different question. You know, 171 has been around, what, for five or six years now? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the most daunting thing when it first came out. It was written specifically for commercial organizations. That's great. But things like ransomware, well, you know, they were barely on the radar if they were at all. And I think we've learned some things from, you know, threat actors and the vectors they use, the methods they employ, the consequences that result. We've learned some things that probably indicate that it's timely to look at a, a Rev 3 of, of 171. And I did hear that Ron Ross of NIST uh, said early this year that they were going to start the process in 2022 to uh, upgrade uh, 171. And we may see the return of those 20 CMMC specific controls that were removed at the announcement of CMMC 2.0. Yeah, and it's, that was another piece that the DOD referenced when they talked about moving away from those CMMC specific practices, is that to the extent the DOD determined that additional controls were necessary in response to the really dynamic threat environment, that they would be working with NIST to ensure that those controls were folded in there. So we talked a bit already about the senior company official attestations that are going to go along with your self-assessment. 
Um, so that ups the ante, obviously. Bob talked a little bit about some of the concern about misrepresenting what your SPURS submissions are. There are obvious concerns with that. That is a bit of a double-edged sword with the moving away from the C3 PAO model across the board for all levels and allowing companies to self-attest. And by having that senior company official attestation that was deliberate and intended to get the attention of the most senior folks within a company to make sure that cybersecurity compliance was taken seriously. The other two things that we have not talked about in terms of updates to CMMC 2.0, Plans of action and milestones. We talked about how under the original version, those were not permitted. They're currently permitted under 7012. It's often a bit of a crutch that industry can lean on because there are things like multi-factor authentication, FIPS validated encryption that takes time to roll out. And the POEMS gave you the runway that you needed in order to do that thoughtfully and successfully. Plans of action and milestones, they are back in CMMC 2.0, uh, but not without their limits. So the DOD has said that we do anticipate that for some, but not all controls, that plans of action milestones will be acceptable. However, there will be a cap on that runway. Right now, they're signaling it will be 180 days, so half of the year. Previously, there was no cap under 7012 for what your POAMs could be. So again, this is, this is a little bit more flexibility. This gives you a little bit of that runway, but it is not without its limits. And then the last thing that was new under CMMC 2.0 that we wanted to flag here is the notion of waivers. This is different from the variance requests that 7012 allows you to do where you can go to the DOD CIO's office, say, I'm doing something, say maybe under ISO 27001, it's not exactly 800 but it's practically the same thing. And I think we're getting to the same point and you can get permission to rely on that variance from 800 -171. The waiver here is different. This is really geared towards your DOD customers because it is it a program based waiver where if one of your customers feels that they have a critical program they need immediate contractor support for, but for whatever reason, there is concern that the ideal competition base who would be bidding on that program would not be able to meet the CMMC requirements either at all or with enough time, then there can be an application to get that waiver. It will be limited potentially in time and in scope, but this is really a DOD mechanism. This is not something that's intended for contractors to take advantage of directly. Let's jump to the next slide. So the other interesting thing, and we'll we'll just briefly touch on this because we know that we're getting to the latter half of our time here. Um, but when the DoD announced CMMC 2.0, they specifically said we're going to have additional guidance that gets into greater granularities, and that's going to be forthcoming. We saw some of that get issued last month in December of 2021. The scoping and assessment guidance were released for levels one and level two. The similar guidance for level three is still under consideration. It's still in the works. Um, but what's really interesting here, particularly about the scoping guidance, is that it provides a lot more detail about what particular assets on your network are in scope or out of scope. And it's a much narrower approach than what we have historically seen under the 7012 regime. Again, with the expectation CMMC level two is in many ways a more robust form of 7012. So for level one, you have, again, that's focused on protecting federal contract information. Um, there is an expectation there that the only thing that is in scope, the only thing that would be subject to the 17 basic requirements pulled from the NIST 800-171 are assets that actually process FCI, um, which is interesting, again, because if you look at the FAR basic safeguarding clause, it's focused on the network on which those assets exist rather than just the assets. You'll see something similar when you look to level two with the scoping guide. The DOD is really focused on the CUI assets, those assets that process the controlled unclassified information, as well as what they call security protection assets, those extensions of your network, sometimes third parties, that are necessary in order to ensure that you are protecting those CUI assets and implementing those 110 controls across those CUI assets. There are other categories of assets that are 
potentially out of scope for your CMMC assessment. It still needs to be assessed in your system security plan. It still needs to be accounted for. But in terms of actually rolling out, implementing those 110 controls in NIST, these are not subject to those controls. There is a contractor risk managed assets, those that we have set up a process to ensure, reasonably ensure, that CUI will not touch those assets, as well as different categories of what the DOD called specialized assets. This is specifically government property that you might be using. Importantly, IoT devices and operational technology systems, restricted information systems, those that you might have to stand up specifically for a, a contract performance, and it has specific security requirements that differ from NIST 800-171. And so per the requirements of your contract, you need to be doing something a little bit differently. Those are out of scope, as well as any testing equipment that you might use. This is much more detail than we have ever received from the DOD in the 7012 world, and it's something that contractors are really trying to digest. Well, that was a great summary, and uh, I, I'm impressed that you were able to put that together, you know, in such a coherent fashion. However, you know, when you start to drill into some of these new asset categories, there's uh, some tough questions. Absolutely. On a security protection asset, I mean, many companies use tools from any number of commercial or specialized vendors to protect their network security. And some, of course, you get to, uh, help with uh, event management or you know, use um, a cl cloud-based uh, managed service provider. Some might uh, have their uh, you know, system uh, incident uh, capability that's run out of the cloud or contracted out to a third party. Uh, are those security protection assets because many of those that I just described that are indispensable for thousands of companies probably have not thought themselves as subject to the 171 or CMMC requirements. And if you suddenly were to say that you can't use any commercial software or security tool or managed service provider without their qualifying through all of 171, you're gonna have problems getting access to those capabilities. And yet, you know, if you don't have any security and you hire anyone that, you know, you might choose, you could well be, you know, hiring the asset that brings the Trojan horse into your network. So we're going to have to find a way to reconcile this. And so far, there doesn't really seem to exist a mechanism to get that done. Yeah, the devil will definitely be in the details with this one for sure. Let's jump to the next slide. All right, so we've talked a lot about what CMMC 2.0 looks like. Now let's talk a little bit about what it uh, what we're still trying to learn. So obviously the rulemaking process is still running its slow, laborious course. Um, we all continue to uh, await with bated breath when we're going to see that rulemaking um, in a proposed rule. As we were just talking about, the devil will be in those details. There are going to be lots of things that we learn about the DOD's approach, for example, to how they are going to implement the scoping guidance that are going to raise questions and inevitably there are going to be there's going to be a dialogue and something I should note um, the DoD has noted and has agreed with some other observations within government that they need to do a better job about communicating on this particular aspect of their cybersecurity compliance and so we do expect that once the rulemaking process gets started that there will be many more opportunities for dialogue hopefully because the pandemic will also allow for many more of those opportunities um, so we won't be caught so flat-footed. Um, the other piece, Bob mentioned third-party MSSPs. Cloud environments and its application with CMMC is still something where we have a big question mark. The DoD has indicated that they are expecting to offer reciprocity to any cloud service provider who has been FedRAMP authorized. They haven't specifically said FedRAMP moderate, but that seems to be the logical expectation, given that, as Townsend said, that's the requirement for cloud service providers under 7012 who are handling CDI. We also still don't know what the civilian side is going to do. Um, 
the Department of Homeland Security in particular has been closely watching CMMC, um, has had some trepidation about the reversion to self-assessments across the board. And so they're exploring something that might be similar to, but slightly different than the DOD's version of CMMC. And we're also not quite sure how this is going to impact our current cybersecurity obligations. We talked about 7019 and 7020, the ongoing DIPCAC assessments. There too, the DOD has said that they expect to offer reciprocity to folks who have undergone a high assessment that's already been submitted into SPURS. Um, but once everything gets ironed out, how will this impact 7012 compliance? How will this interact with the EO and the streamlining process that we discussed with a potential FAR CUI clause? There is, this is really, really messy and untangling and clarifying all of this is no easy task. Um, and then the last point, again, Bob raised the question of sufficiency. So what the DOD DOD has really said is here, we need to we need to make sure that we prioritize the viability of CMMC. Let's get to a place where we can actually start implementing. And it is of note that it is called CMMC 2.0. That does leave open the question of whether eventually we're going to see a 3.0 and a 4.0. Is NIST going to be updating its requirement? So while this is certainly the start of an ongoing conversation, it's certainly not going to be the last time that we talk about CMMC. All right, let's jump to the next slide. So we're going to switch gears a little bit um, and spend the last couple minutes here. We've got a couple more things that we want to talk about after this. So we're going to see if we can make this time work for us. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about the DOJ's Civil Cyber Fraud Initiative. We've talked a lot about so much that has happened over the past year and the variety of levers that the federal government has been pulling to make sure that everyone can sort of do their part um, to help improve cybersecurity, particularly with in the federal contracting space. This is the DOJ's lever that they are pulling. We have all talked for years now about the practical reality that DOJ was increasing their focus on cyber fraud, um, particularly related to issues like adequate security under 7012. They have formally announced that this is a priority. This is no longer a hypothetical discussion. Um, so there is a new specific initiative that's being led out of the Civil Division's Commercial Litigation branch and fraud section. And the idea is that they are going to take a laser focus on identifying and prosecuting false claims act violations that government contractors commit by failing to follow their cybersecurity requirements per their contract. Let's jump to the next slide here. And there's three particular scenarios that they're focused on. The first is a situation where you are providing products or services to the federal government. There was a specific set of security mechanisms, protections that needed to be built in to those products or services, and they were deficient. They were not there. The second is misrepresenting your cybersecurity compliance. This automatically makes us all think about 7012, where we have an obligation internally on our contractor network to make sure that we are protecting sensitive information. We have made a representation to the government that we will do so through various mechanisms, like, for example, adequate security and implementing NIST 800 171. And we have actually, in practice, failed to do that. That's the second hook. The third hook, and the one that I think caught the most attention within industry, is the idea that if you fail to detect or timely report cybersecurity incidents in accordance with your contract requirements, that could be an actionable False Claims Act violation. And again, we're going to talk about 7012 because that's where we see some of the broadest incident reporting requirements. Contractors still to this day, even though 7012 has been around for almost a decade now, still struggle with understanding what triggers a report. A lot of that stems to figuring out what CUI they may or may not have on their network, what's impacted by it, when to report, when does that 72 hour clock start. And as a practical matter, this is the DOJ's way of saying we're going to put the thumb, our thumb on the scale and say when in doubt, this is another reason to err on the side of reporting. The DOD treats this as really an intelligence gathering mechanism. Kristen talked earlier about how valuable those IC3 reports are to the FBI. This is similar to that for the DOD in particular. And one of the reasons why the DOJ is trying to put pressure on contractors to be a little bit more liberal with their reporting. 
Let's yeah, jump. yeah, I've heard it put a little more strongly. You know, we have that DC three counterpart to the civilian uh, reporting mechanism that the FBI uh, hosts. Yeah, yes. So, you know, there's been a widespread perception that contractors uh, under report uh, incidents to DC three and Originally, the reporting obligation was intended to help DOD do a damage assessment after the fact. In other words, if CUI was compromised, what's the harm to the military from the fact that maybe the Chinese have it? But since that time, incident reporting has become, I think, you know, either cause one or cause two across the executive branch. And it's certainly a central focus, um, as you mentioned, mentioned Townsend, of the executive order and it's emphasized as well, Kristen, you know, by the FBI and, and others in the law enforcement community, incident reporting is a big deal. And it isn't just to figure out how much, how badly you're damaged. It's also, it's also to get an understanding of, of the method that was used in the attack, to understand more about the attacker uh, individually or as an organization. And we're trying to work to this point where we get information fast enough and can process it fast enough that it can be distributed in an actionable form to other companies who would be similarly at risk. So I think that DOJ will be paying a lot of attention, uh, as Kristen pointed out, to situations where there is a loss, clearly a breach of security, and yet there was no timely cyber incident mm -hmm. report. Let's jump to the next slide, please. And there are all of the slides, lots of content that we're covering here. All right, so as a practical matter, what can the contracting community expect coming out of the civil cyber fraud initiative? Um, first and foremost, we're already starting to see this. There's going to be an increased allocation of resources within the government to make sure that they can prioritize those potential FCA cyber claims, both investigation on the front end and prosecution on the back end. The second is increased coordination within government. This is something that we all talk about, how we want to have low wall within the government. There are all these different inputs from a cybersecurity perspective. You've got FBI, you've got CISA, um, you have Treasury, the DOD, all of those things come together and there's going to be more communication internally to understand what the potential implications are of contractor compliance and what the best course of action, again, the best allocation of those resources. The other piece that's inevitable is that we're going to see a peaked interest from the relators bar who are considering being a whistleblower where they see, you know, we all see the warts of the sausage making process that often happens. Cybersecurity is really hard. There are always trade-offs involved and really difficult discussions. And the DOJ is aware that there's a lot of people involved in those discussions. And they actually made a specific plea to say, we are relying on you, the whistleblowers, to make sure that if you're unsure, if you think what's happening is not the right course of action, we are looking to you to come forward and help us investigate and determine what the appropriate next steps are. So as a practical matter, there are financial incentives involved. We absolutely expect to see that. Um, and at least anecdotally, we've been seeing that over the past 12 months already. And then the Oh, Bob, sorry, were you no, about to jump in? Ahead, Just the last piece, obvious, all of this is going to culminate in an uptick in investigations, in settlements, something that there have not been many of publicly, and litigation. Again, something that thus far has been pretty limited. That is going to increase almost inevitably. So that does raise the question of what do you do to avoid uh, liability or at least to minimize the risk? Well, I think what will happen in, the, in larger companies is that some tough decisions that ordinarily would be made by a CISO as to whether to spend more or less on cybersecurity or whether to act quicker or, or slower. I think some of those decisions are going to involve the chief risk officer mm -hmm. because one very good way suggested by Kristen to show that you really were at or above the standard of care and to avoid any suggestion that you had a, uh, an improper state of mind in the management of your cybersecurity um, is to do a really good job and to document your investments and where there are disagreements to make sure that you've given careful consideration to all of the views and that you've taken the time to document the disagreements and to document carefully the reasons that you chose a particular course of action. All of us on this uh, behind this table know 
that the, the worst way to attempt to defend a False Claims Act allegation is to create the rationale and find <laughs> people to describe it after the investigation has started. So I think this will have a motivating effect upon not just contractor compliance, but overall contractor actions to enhance their enter enterprise security. Next slide, please. So we're just gonna quickly run through, this is the last slide we have on the civil cyber fraud initiative. We've got a couple more points that we wanna cover, um, but this is really the intended series of benefits that the DOJ has identified. The idea is, is that that rising tide, it's going to raise all ships. We're going to help make sure that when a private sector entity is getting paid to do something, that they follow through on that. The taxpayer dollars are being used appropriately. Something else that was interesting that the DOJ flagged is ensuring a level playing field um, where a lot of contractors have invested so much time, resources, blood, sweat, and tears into ensuring they have top class cybersecurity. And that might not necessarily stand out because of the way that current things are evaluated and how that specter of false claims act again thus far has been pretty limited in its application based on what we've seen from public settlements and litigation. Um, another part of this is also to make sure that, and again, this goes to the incident reporting piece that Bob and Kristen talked about, making sure that we're just getting more information out there. Let's help you know, grease those skids to make sure that more information is flowing from the private sector to the public sector so that that information can be acted on so we're all safer. And again, we talked about the taxpayer element here. That's always what's driving public procurement and making sure that to the extent there are losses there that they get made whole from it. And if I can draw attention to the box at the bottom there, there is per the justice manual credit given to companies for disclosure, remediation and cooperation with ongoing investigations. So that does include working with the FBI. If you have one of these incidents, you can get credit for it. All right, let's jump to the next slide, please. Now we're turning to, to some other issues. I know we don't have much time left, so we'll try to get through these relatively quickly. Um, we've been focused um, all day today on the cybersecurity, data security side of things. So we thought we'd just touch quickly on privacy. Um, there are within the FAR certain requirements for contractors to protect personally identifiable information. Um, it's important to note that most of these relate to a contractor that's operating a system of records on behalf of an agency. So you are in the position of managing PII for an agency. This is, this is separate from managing PII of your own employees or your customers. Um, we're really talking here about managing PII for government agencies. Um, there is a provision within the Privacy Act that uh, makes it applicable to contractors in those circumstances. There's a requirement within the FAR to post a Privacy Act notification, um, setting forth various requirements from the Privacy Act. Um, as well as certain training requirements if you're operating in that capacity. Um, I would also point you to another NIST publication, 800-122, which is a guide to protecting PII. Um, discusses, uh, this can be used as a guidance document regardless if you're in that specific role as a contractor, um, but discusses the confidentiality of PII. And I'll also note that various agencies, GSA in particular is one, um, have very stringent reporting requirements for a breach of PII in these situations. And it's usually one hour. Um, so you wanna make sure if, if you have these obligations within your contract that you understand um, the protections that are, are supposed to be in place as well as the reporting. Um, and I'll also just briefly mention um, on the privacy side, obviously there are a multitude of regulations at the state level um, and otherwise that you may be subject to for employee PII, um, customer and end user PII outside of your government contracts. So that's a, a whole nother ball of wax that we won't be getting into today. Um, but we wanted to just make sure that we touched on the privacy side of things um, as well as, as the important focus on cybersecurity today. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, at the outset that there were you know, examples of cyber attacks upon operational technology. That includes manufacturing systems, programmable logic controllers and the like. Next slide, please. Well, you know, once again, there's a problem. Uh, most of the DOD efforts and those of other federal agencies so far have focused upon information systems. And so when we talk about 171, its primary purpose is to uh, impose 110 controls on how you protect an information system. 
it's not written for operational technology. And yet, you know, in many advanced factories of defense contractors, one or another form of controlled unclassified information is used in the factory to run the machines, to inform the mill or the like. And so we've got that tension again. Uh, in some respects, it's difficult, in a few respects, impossible to conform to 171 for many factory systems. And yet you don't want to give operational technology the proverbial free pass because it would be very hazardous to our defense industrial base if OT were unsecured. Um, in the new uh, gu gu assessment guidance, there's that category that Kate mentioned of specialized assets. Well, you know, that's OT. But I think we're going to, to see choices uh, that are difficult for companies to make as to how to protect OT. And I think we will see further government initiative uh, so that uh, we are protecting not just information technology systems against exfiltration of data, but also operational technology systems against um, exfiltration of the data they use or against uh, threats to its uh, integrity or availability. Next slide, please. All right, we know that we're at time, so we're gonna very quickly just say that if you are in the business of providing IoT devices to the federal government, there are some NIST standards out there, if we can jump to the next slide, please, that we highly recommend that you take a look at. Um, NIST Special Publication 800-213 and 213A Alpha. I know this feels like it's been a bit of a NIST tutorial, and in many ways it has been. Um, the short story here is that by the end of the year, we are expecting another FAR clause that would mandate that any IoT device procured by the federal government needs to meet these requirements laid out in list, barring an exception from senior levels of the federal government. So again, if you're in that business, we highly recommend you pay attention to these developments. And with that, I think on behalf of my esteemed colleagues here, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we unfortunately don't have time to answer questions, um, but we're always happy to talk offline and we really appreciate the time. Okay, thank you very much to the entire panel, to uh, Townsend, Bob, Kate, and uh, Kristen Grimes from the FBI. Thank you very much for uh, an outstanding panel. Uh, we gave you two hours this year and it was not enough. And so we may have to come back and do something uh, mid-year to bring all the updates together. What I liked about this panel and so many of our panels is uh, lots of people talk about what's going on and uh, cite to cases and uh, references to rules. What was interesting here is the so what, what it means and what companies can do about it, what uh, firms need to know and what companies need to know to uh, navigate through the system. So I really thank you for the time and effort you put into putting this panel together. Uh, the slides, will make them available uh, after the entire annual review is done. <clears throat> So again, let me thank uh, our sponsors who are on this slide and the next slide. I couldn't have done this program uh, without their strong support. And that concludes our program for today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and on our final panels on Thursday. Have a great day. <laughs>